on the personal level, the Romanovs, Nicholas and Alexander, had produced four lovely daughters, Olga, Titania, Marie, and Anastasia. But they desperately wanted a son to carry on the line. And in 1904, a few years before this, Alexandra had born a son. Oh, they were so delighted. They named the child Alexei. He would be the Tsarevich heir to the throne. They were absolutely fixated on this beautiful little baby. He was the light of their lives until he was about 10 months old and began to scream in agony. What on earth? The doctors were summoned and examined him and tested him, and they found out the child was hemophilic. Hemophilia is transmitted through the female genes from Queen Victoria, in this case, to her granddaughter, Alexandra, and then to her son. It only affects the males. Well, of course, Alexandra, the empress, was absolutely hysterical. She was going to find some way to cure her child if it was the last thing she did. The doctor said, Madam, there is no cure. And the empress was hysterical. The emperor couldn't focus on anything except trying to deal with this. And many historians feel that the birth of Alexis was the death knell of the Romanov family and dynasty. It did bring to light somebody whom you've all heard of, Grigory Afimovich Rasputin. He was a peasant from uh, Pokrovskoya, way off in the distant part of Russia. He entered a monastery. He was so sexually active they dumped him out. He went to the Middle East and learned all kinds of occult things and came back and in his village and was able to affect some sort of cures, especially with farm animals. And then he decided that he was clever enough to go to the capital and ply his trade there. So he hired on as a truck driver and worked his way across the continent to St. Petersburg, arriving in 1902. He did become very successful. He, was, he set himself up as a mystic, a, a seer, a healer, and he had a large following within months. The success of his ministrations were in large part due, one must as, uh, assume now from what we know, to his natural ability as an hypnotist. This gave him quite a reputation. Now, one of the Empress' closest friends was Baroness Virobova went back and forth from St. Petersburg by train to the Tsarskoye Seo, the Tsar's village down the coast. And one evening while the Empress and Virobova were talking on the phone, the Empress was saying how the child was ill and she was distracted and all the rest of it. And Virobova said, well, I think I've met somebody who might help. Who? Who? Well, she described Rasputin. The Empress said, oh no, he's a peasant. Couldn't think of it. Well, a day later, the child was still in agony, and she called uh, Virobova back and said, bring him down. So uh, Baroness Virobova brought Rasputin down to Tsarskoye Sewo and um, introduced him to the imperial couple. Well, he, he clasped Nicholas. You know, never, nobody ever touches the royals. <laughs> he clasped Nicholas by the legs and began to kiss his hands and say, little father, beloved savior, and all this business. And, Nicholas was trying to pry him loose and say, Tear, talk to my wife. And, uh, and he went over to the Empress and clasped her, little mother, beloved, you know, saint, and all this business. And finally, uh, when he calmed down, Alexandra said, Do you think you can help my child? You could hear the baby screaming, something terrible, behind the closed doors. Could you help my child? I will cure him. Ooh. Well, he's in his, I will cure him. He went right to the door and opened it. Oh, no, wait, uh, no, stay, he said. What? He never said stay to the Imperials. He went in and shut the door. Oh, Nicky, he's going to kill him. Soon the screaming stopped. <gasps> they rushed in. And there was Rasputin at the foot of the bed. Glowering. <laughs> and the little boy. <laughs> perfectly happy, calm, quiet. Nicky, he's cured him. Well, cure may be an overstatement, but... After that, Rasputin was in. Now, his greatest influence was with the Empress. He led her into the deepest, most miasmic of her religious life. He tried on numerous occasions to speak to the Tsar, to Nicholas, to give him advice. But Nicholas wasn't interested in taking advice from this peasant. He called him, they both called him Staritz, holy man, and and Nicholas accepted him sort of as an eccentric peasant who might, he was keeping the empress quiet. It was worth it, whatever. 
Once he said to Nicholas, little father, give your wealth to the peasants. They have nothing you have so much. Oh yes, Starts, of course. Well, we'll work on this, yes, naturally. Another time he said to the Tsar, little father, don't get into a war with Germany. Beware of the Germans. Oh, of course. Well, we all want peace now, don't we? Yeah. No. Just shoved him away. Well, he was dead right on both counts, wasn't he? And he was right on a hell of a lot more. Well, now, Rasputin's private life was bacchanalian. He lived in a grand manner. He had plenty of money now. People pouring money over, including the royals. He had a house, two or more than a house, one or two. Lived uh, surrounded with naked boys and girls, smoking dope and drinking and, you know, just having all kinds of fun. I'll leave you to the imaginings of it. It was just, you know, absolutely extraordinary what, the way he lived. And, of course, people gossiped and the ministers heard about it and some of them tried to advise the imperial couple about this man's personal life. They wouldn't hear of it, of course. Even Vera Bova uh, uh, tried to explain to the empress that this, and she got short shrift. The empress was furious. I don't know how many, you know this, when we're absolutely fixated on something that is good for us, we don't want to hear somebody down, uh, speaking down about it, or whatever the expression is. We don't want to hear that. And she said to the people that came there, you're only trying to destroy the only man who can help my child. I will not hear another word. Go away. Well, when the empress said that, you shut up. What else could you do? She did not like informers. Now remember, 1916, the government, the imperial government, was under attack from within. Civil war was breaking out. Also, the nation was involved in the great war with Germany. But that had been a catastrophe for Russia. And of course the monarch, weak and irresolute, was trapped at the front. What could happen next? Well, you know, for several years, many people felt within the government, within the imperial family, the country at large, they felt that the cause of all the trouble was Rasputin. He was controlling the emperor, and the emperor was making all these mistakes. Well, this was not, none of it was true, but you know how public perceptions are. A group of highly placed young people, one of them was the Tsar's nephew, Grand Duke Dmitri Pavlovich, and a few others had tried to kill Rasputin. Well, they'd failed. The Empress Alexandra had surrounded her favorite with her police guard and escort everywhere he went. She was terrified something would happen to him. But uh, Pavlovich and his associates weren't going to give up if they could just lure him to one of their houses alone and kill him. That was their goal. Well, finally, the others were Prince Perushevich, Prince Yusupov, and Prince Alexev. Yusupov said, well, maybe I have an idea. Rasputin was notorious as a pushover for beautiful women. Yusupov said, well, we'll lure him to my palace, the Moika. And we'll say that my wife, Irina, who was absolutely dazzling, she was barely 20, at 98 she was a great beauty. She was simply fabulous. We'll say that she has headaches, and then we'll get him there to cure the headaches. Well, we'll try it. Well, they finally managed it. Rasputin agreed to come to the Moika to meet the princess. He arrived late in the evening with his guarded limousine, the police escort, the whole business. Yusupov directed them to a side driveway. There was a low door in the wall at the bottom of the building. Rasputin got out. Yusupov said, it's fine, Staritz, I'll take care of everything. Rasputin waved off his guards and limousine. We'll call you when you're needed. And Yusupov conducted him into the house. Now, this was a ground floor apartment. In America, it's called a rumpus room. It was a casual place filled with sofas and cushions and low lights and drapery and a, a great table covered with delicious cakes and sweet wines, which they knew Rasputin favored, all liberally laced with strychnine. And, of course, Yusupov wanted him to partake. Where is the princess, said Rasputin. Oh, she'll be down in a moment, Starlitz. She's entertaining her guests. She'll be right down. And they could hear something going on upstairs, music and so on. So, some refreshments, Starrets, please, a little wine. Oh, he didn't seem very interested. But 
Yusupov was famous, well, maybe famous is overstating it, he was well known to entertain his guests with his very fine voice and the guitar. And Rasputin said, play for me, Yusupov, play, play. Well, he took up his guitar and he began to sing my old Kentucky home and home on the... <laughs> oh, the, the Russians loved this sort of stuff. And as Rasputin began to play with the cakes and took a bite and a little wine, a little more and so on. Well, after a while, Yusupov was getting frantic. He wasn't dying, he wasn't falling over, he wasn't even seeing what's going on. He said, just a moment, Stars, I'll go up and fetch the princess. Oh. Well, he rushed upstairs. The other, there was nobody in the building. Uh, the other conspirators were dumping up and down, making like a party with a Victrola going, you know, it was nothing. So they said, what's happening? What's happening? He isn't dying. He isn't falling over. He isn't doing anything. What do we do? One of them said, here, take this pistol and go down and shoot him. <laughs> well, Yusupov rushed back down with the pistol. Rasputin looked at him. He took the pistol out and aimed at Rashford and fired twice, hitting him both times. Rashford was staggered, but he was not falling. He lunged at Yusupov and grabbed him by the neck and started to throw him. Of course, Yusupov was shouting, help, 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 come save me. Well, of course, all the conspirators rushed downstairs. Somebody grabbed up the pistol on the floor and shot four more shots into Rasputin. Well, by then, he staggered and began to fall, but somebody had a candlestick and they were hitting him on the head. Whack, whack. Finally, he fell and seemingly unconscious. They dragged him to the middle of the floor and rolled him up in the carpet. Somebody went to a side door and said, yes, it's here. They had a limousine waiting for them, their own. The motor running, the driver and everything, they knew it was all planned. So they bundled him up and dragged him out and shoved him into the limo. And then they tore off over to the Nieva River, which was only a, a meter away, drove out onto the bridge and heaved him out and over the railing and down onto the ice. Of course, the Nieva was frozen, it was December. Crack the ice and he began to sink. Well, they piled back in the limousine and made away as fast as they could. Now, there are a couple of versions of what happened next. Somebody said that uh, someone had observed all of this and called the police. Another version was the police patrol eventually saw the body had not gone through the ice, fished him out, took him to the morgue, identified him, performed an autopsy, and then, of course, found that he had drowned. None of the wounds had killed him.